I grew up near the Ohio River. As a teenager, we used to go swimming in the Ohio, where it crossed the, into Chester, West Virginia. We were swimming one day, and someone got the bright idea that we ought to swim across the entire river, a distance of about one mile. And whoever finished last would walk back across the bridge, get the car, drive back, and pick up the rest of us. Just when we were about to start, my best friend, Nevitt Stockdale, said, I'm not going. I said, what do you mean you're not going? He said, I can't swim that far. Oh, Nevitt, you can make it. And if you can't make it, I'll save you, I encouraged him. Now, it was important to me that Nevitt try to swim because he was the only one I was sure I could beat. You do that for me, Nevitt questioned. I said, you've got my word. We started out. We got a quarter of the way across the river. And Nevitt was doing super. We got halfway across the river and Nevitt was doing great. We got three quarters of the way across the river and Nevitt started to struggle. As he predicted, and in spite of doing fine until then, he said he didn't think he could make it all the way across. He called on me to save him as I had promised. And I did the same thing that you might have done if you were in my situation. I, pretend, I tried to pretend that I couldn't hear him calling me. Nevitt was my best friend. As long as my feet could touch the ground. But in the water, I was only worried about me, Lou Holtz. Everyone else had already finished, and there was just Nevitt and me three quarters of the way across the river. Nevitt pleaded for help, but no one came to his aid. Finally, he did the only thing he could logically do to save his life. He turned around and swam back. He ended up swimming a mile and a half because deep down inside, he didn't believe that he could swim a mile across the river. He didn't believe strongly enough in himself. He had an excuse not to succeed. So he swam farther by turning around and going back because he was scared. Play four. Understand what you're trying to do. Another thing that is important is understanding what it is you are trying to do. What about you? Are you trying to be the most popular person at school? Are you trying to help other people? Are you trying to get an education or just trying to skate through? Just ask yourself, what am I trying to do? It's important you know the answer to that question. Notre Dame is a special university. Why? It understands what it's trying to do. Education is its first priority, always, in every circumstance. The purpose of the university is to educate all its students, period. It has a faculty because it has students. It has coaches because it has athletes. Every decision Notre Dame makes is centered on how it can best educate these students. That's how its decisions are always made. Notre Dame understands what it has to do. Life is not all that complicated. Just ask yourself, what am I trying to do? You want to open up a business? Let me tell you about business. It's simple. All you're trying to do in business is to help people get what they need and want. And it's about determining what they want and need. But people's needs and wants change. And life changes. And your life is going to change. So don't fight the change. In 1963, I got a job selling cemetery plots. When I got that job, my wife told me, you won't sell anything. Well, she understood me better than I understood myself. I didn't sell many cemetery plots and ended up selling our car, our stereo, and our TV to pay the bills. I learned that I wasn't an effective salesman. It wasn't what I wanted to do. In the 1870s, some business people determined that other business people could benefit from the typewriter. So in 1878, they brought the typewriter to market. It was a success, but soon there was a serious problem. People learned to type so well and so fast that the keys stuck. So they said, how can we keep the keys from sticking? Do you know what they decided to do? They decided to slow down the typists they rearranged the letters on the keypad, putting the most used letters in the hardest to reach spots. They put an E up here and an O over there and stuck a C way down in the corner. They figured nobody would be able to type very fast because they would have to hunt for the letters. They met the need for change and it worked, or at least it worked long enough for better machines to be built. Now, what about today? There is no way you can stick any key on today's keyboards, no matter how fast you type. But if you tried to change the order of the letters now, everybody would get mad. They've learned the current system and don't want to change. 
even if a different arrangement of letters would work better. That's true, it's been tried, and the rearranged keyboard hasn't caught on. Nobody wants change. If you go out for a sport and decide to take part in an extracurricular activity like a language club, then stay with it for the entire season or year. My wife and I insisted on this with our kids. We expected them to keep their commitment whether or not they liked the coach, whether or not they won or lost, whether they played or sat on the bench. Quitting would be the easy way out. But change is good if you understand what you're trying to do. So if you understand that something is not for you, after honoring your initial commitment, then make the decision thoughtfully and move on to something else. I've always believed that if you drop one activity, you should replace it with another, with something you find worthwhile. Use the newfound time to improve yourself. Always stop and ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? And ask, what am I trying to do? Play five, dream big dreams. If there's one thing in this world that's been exciting for me, it's been dreaming big dreams and then having them come true. One dream I had early in my coaching career was to coach at Notre Dame. So when I took the head football coach's job at the University of Minnesota, I negotiated my dream into my contract there. If the Notre Dame job was offered to me, I could take it. When you find out about anybody who's ever been successful, you find out that they've had dreams. I was with Michael Jordan recently, and he told me about his dream to play basketball for the University of North Carolina. He had dreams about what he wanted to do, and he made his dreams happen. He played for North Carolina and was on a national championship team there. I started naming my dreams when I was 28, and that's when I really started acting on my dreams. Before that, I just sort of went along. This was in 1966 when I took a job at the University of South Carolina as an assistant football coach under a head coach by the name of Marvin Bass. My wife was eight months pregnant with our third child, Kevin. I was there only about a month when I picked up the paper and read the headline, Marvin Bass resigns. I said to my wife, I wonder if he's related to my coach. Well, obviously they were one and the same and the next thing you know, I was unemployed. My wife had to go to work and I stayed home and I got this book and it said that if you're bored with life, if you don't have a burning desire for anything, you should name your dreams and write them down. I started really thinking about my life. What were the things I wanted to do? What did I want to accomplish? So I broke my dreams down to five categories. Things I wanted to do religiously and spiritually. Things I wanted to do as a husband and a father things I wanted to accomplish professionally, things I wanted to accomplish financially, and finally, things I wanted to do for excitement. Then I started listing all my dreams in each of these categories. For example, I wanted to parachute out of an airplane, and I wanted to land on an aircraft carrier, and go in a submarine, and be on The Tonight Show. I wanted to go whitewater rafter in Hell's Canyon on the Snake River. I wanted to go to the White House for dinner. I wanted to see the Pope. I wanted to go to the Holy Land. I wanted to go on an African safari. I wanted to go to Papalona and run with the bulls, but of course with a person slower than I. I wrote down 107 dreams. My wife came home and I said to her, here's 107 of my dreams. We're gonna do them all. She looked at them and said, gee, that's great. Why don't you go ahead and get a job? So we made it 108 dreams. <laughs>